this session is with Mo Karim Gaini. Mo is a CFO and co-founder at Corate. He has proven experience of over five years uh, experience in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. He is a qualified financial and economics graduate from the University of Wits Waters Rand and on track for a 2 1 honors degree in a BCom honors finance postgraduate con- um, qualification. Congratulations. Um, Mo provides mentorship and empowerment blockchain talent skills through a partner firm called Crypto Turns. He is a partner to multiple top 25 blockchain companies, including Avalanche. Alron Gold and Al Algorand, a serial entrepreneur with a passion for blockchain technology and bridging the gap between traditional finance and this new emerging technology. He's also a senior contributor to waterrelief.org, building well over 5,000 wells in poorer countries and enabling the payments of Bitcoin for contri- contributors. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mo, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Lavanya. Hi everyone, my name is Mohammed Karam Ghani and I am the Chief Operations Officer and Co-Director of the Curate NFT Marketplace app. Um, Firstly, I'd like to thank Lavinia and Sonia for having me here. It's a real honor to be speaking at Bitcoin Africa. So to start off, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about my journey. It began as a curious 17-year-old teenager with a passion for technology. I was a highly curious young man who always wondered how things work and what they do. No matter what it was, I wasn't enjoying, I was not enjoying the ride, but I was trying to see underneath it and how the thing actually worked. And luckily in a time with Google nowadays, it's kind of easy to get those answers. But the tricky part came in when my eager mind started to wonder and I would start to ask how this could be improved. And today I'd like to share with you a little bit of my journey through the cryptocurrency space, because I feel to really understand why the cryptocurrency space is what it is today and where it's going is to understand the beginning because back when I started in the early days, um, the technology has remained the same for Bitcoin and Ethereum, but there's so much that has been built on top of it that have brought us the DeFi and NFTs that we have today, when back then it didn't exist. So now you may be asking, how can something have the same technology, but have such bigger things built on top of it? And this is when my life really got interesting in my journey when I started off is, it was back in the 2010 World Cup and I was kind of a curious young teenager and I ended up on the dark web and I was sort of checking it out. I think like every kid does, or maybe the tech geek in me or tech, the tech geeky kids do like myself. And I came across the Hitman for Hire and next to it, I saw that it cost 6,000 BDC. And to myself, I just thought like, who or what is this Bitcoin? And my little curious mind wandered off again and led me to Google a little bit. And That's when I found out that it was some magic internet money. And leaving it at that, my curiosity was piqued and I carried on with life. But little did I know that that was going to be the stepping stone to me finding one of the largest clean mining energy cryptocurrency mining operations in Canada with over $10 million in assets under management. Having this somewhat obsessive, curious mind then led me down the crypto rabbit hole, which really sparked my intriguement as given how rapidly evolving it is and I was rapidly evolving with it. And now that I've finished that little bit of an intro, I'll jump to more or less when it carried on. And by the time 2018 came, I was traveling to London for business related to this mining operation, Jumeirah Capital. And we were actually having dinner at my aunt's house when my mentor at the time and now my close friend um, randomly on the different dinner table, just called an Uber ride and said, we're going to the Southwest. And bear in mind, I hadn't seen my family in over a year. And I was like, man, what the hell are you doing? Where are you taking us? And we randomly just set up, set up from supper and went to these people. I went to go visit. And this is actually the first time I met James Hakim, who is my partner in Curate. And he was working on a company called Adlux then, also in the tech space, which was a unique um, advertising network. And James asked me, Mo, what is it that you do? And being the excited kid and having that passion for cryptocurrency and blockchain, I was more than happy to ramble on and just tell him just about anything. And it was at that point, we just took a picture at dinner, 
and we went our separate ways. And gotta say, James is a great guy, really top class, great hospitality, and part of the reason I really liked him. And gotta say, also a really smart guy. Then I went home and kind of continued in my mining operation. I promise you that all this build up of the intro is leading to something, and you guys are gonna love it. It's gonna really put a lot of context to deeper. And by then, the crypto market was really slowing down, and the ICO boom had died out. Lots of people had lost money, and there really wasn't much interest in the cryptocurrency space. I mean, if you think about it, um, for those that were around then, if you were to fall off the, a building from the third floor, it's going to take you some time to climb up again. And that is where cryptocurrency was at this time. And the mining operation in Canada kind of took like a sideways turn as well. That wasn't going too well. I had to shut down a portion of my mining. And to me, I think this would be the first sort of rug pull I ever experienced, which is really interesting. So this is my own version of a rug pull before rug pulls became a popular thing in the DeFi space. And looking back, I'm really grateful for this experience. And yeah, so by the beginning of 2019, jumping forward a little bit, um, this is sort of when my when I sort of kick-started back into the crypto space. And James had reached out to me with the idea of Z-Man, which was the predecessor to, predecessor to Curate. And Z-Man was a fashion discovery platform. And it kind of employed me to ask how we could use crypto to really be this thing. And I was like, you know what? We saw the ICO boom. Why don't we start by creating a token and putting it out there? I mean, that was the first like sort of dabbling I had in smart contracts. And as you can probably tell, since it was 2019, that didn't do too great as people were really hot sore from the ICO boom. So we spent about two quiet years with not much happening. And we just sat in the background, building our community for Curate and Project while we carried out our daily lives. I continued my studies at the University of Witwatersrand Rand with, and managed what was left of my mining operation. And I'm truly grateful that I still had my head in the game, thanks to my assets under management with Jumeirah Capital. And then this is things got really exciting because by July of 2020, my time started to free up and I stumbled across DeFi. And to me, this was sort of the first time I had seen this sort of a use case in cryptocurrency. So for those that don't know, DeFi is decentralized finance. So it's basically looking at providing returns or anything financially related services on the Ethereum blockchain or on a blockchain for that matter, looking at the wider ecosystem today. And when I stumbled across this, it was like, yeah, this is something super new, something super exciting. And that good old fire of the 2016 to 2017 bull run started to stir up in me again. And things were looking crazy. And then these yield farming protocols were like providing these five digit returns and there were rug pulls happening on projects. And what's interesting about this is what these yield farming protocols, what it was actually doing is there was something called decentralized exchanges that came about. So if you think about Uniswap, SushiSwap, and the pancake swap being the three most popular today, um, this really broke down a big barrier of entry to cryptocurrency by allowing projects who had a token to make it a liquid token without going through the extensive measures of listing on a central exchange, whether it be the requirements, which were costly, or the listing fees, which are even more costly to, to think about. And this kind of gave them an opportunity to get a little bit creative. So what these protocols were doing, you would get Shroom Finance, Pickles, some animals, Sushi Swap was one of them that were sort of providing returns for those that provided liquidity for the token. So what that meant, if you take some of, say, Shroom's tokens and some Ethereum and put it on the Uniswap protocol to provide liquidity. So you're taking real money and their token and then taking that IOU for the token called LP tokens and taking it on their website, you were getting paid in the, their currency. And this was sort of like a game of hot potato where users were kind of staking it to earn more of their token, which was illiquid by providing liquidity for their token. And it was kind of first in, last out. And we saw a lot of currencies go up really quickly and come down just as quickly. And this is when my DeFi curiosity peaked and I went down that rabbit hole again. And before you knew it, I was running MetaMask in my browser and interacting with smart contracts to lock up in the geyser. 
and receive a token that I could trade on Uniswap. And boy, oh boy, did that get me excited. There was just so many new things to explore and it kept me really busy. busy. Honestly, I felt like a kid in the toy store and it was great to see that energy come back into crypto. So this continued for months and months. And once I felt like a sort of a regular in the space and I got my way around the DEXs and the farming protocols and stuff, I turned my head to curate and I was like, hey, this has got to be a golden opportunity. We got to capitalize on this. I mean, this could be big. And I immediately hit up James again. And I was like, right, you know what, James? I know what we got to do. And going down the DeFi rabbit hole had led me to find a bunch of so-called moonshot telegram groups. Um, now, I don't know if any of y'all had come across this in your experience with DeFi, but if there was any space to find a small cap gem, which is an up and coming currency, it was on these moonshot groups. And we started to reach out to these guys and schedule AMAs with them to spread the word of Curate. By the way, Z-Man had now transformed in Curate, which I'm sure great. James would agree is a much better name and much catchier as well. And together, James was running these AMAs and I started working on getting a little bit of CEDA to list onto this Uniswap DEX. And that was incredible. And boom, we had our token listed because we couldn't reach the high entry level of the exchanges. And this was a nice way that opened up the opportunity for a lot of small projects to actually get the, the stepping in the game. And it was really exciting. And this was a really just big moment for us as a team. And James continued during this to run the AMAs and use his sweet charm and good looks to spread the awesome word of Curate and what we were doing. And I just wanted to join this DeFi revolution. So I went on from this to create my own little farming protocol for Curate called Curate.Finance. So it wasn't a fruit, it wasn't a vegetable, and it definitely wasn't an animal, something a little bit more serious. And we kind of did the same thing, put this ridiculous APY and played around in this. And what was exciting is I really got to see how the smart contracts had changed from the days of the ICO, where it was simply just a smart contract that minted a token with an amount and a name. And now that had evolved to kind of adding some mathematic coding to it that allowed it to provide a yield. And the, the, the possibilities were kind of like spinballing. I mean, there were some people that were doing token lockups where you could lock it for a certain amount of time. This led up to doors where you could will execution and even bond issuing if we go a little bit further as a year later. And by January of 2029, we continued to spread the word and develop behind the scenes. Alongside that, the blockchain ecosystem was expanding and more and more tokens were popping up like wildfire. I mean, there were more tokens in a day than I had meals in a day by far. I mean, there were thousands. And this is when we saw the Ethereum network start to get a little bit clogged up because of this greater attention on DeFi. There was just so much volume and so many transactions with people interacting and experiment that Ethereum fees started to get really congested and the network fees skyrocketed. I mean, at its peak, we were looking at maybe about $200 at its peak. And this resulted in an alternate chain, Binance Smart Chain, which became quite as popular as wealth forming. And with this parallel ecosystem of Binance Smart Chain, being on Ethereum to get to Binance Smart Chain was not very simple. It was pretty complex, even for somebody like me, that was well versed inside the crypto space. And the thing is, both these ecosystems really had incredible projects being built on either side. I mean, Ethereum being the main one has the most users, obviously being the most developed, had the absolutely great protocols like Aave and MakerDAO, and the list goes on forever. But at the same time, Binance Smart Chain had its capabilities and features like PancakeSwap and Binance Smart Chain launch pads were popping up. There were really bringing to light some awesome projects. Uh, the drawback was really came in when trying to go from the one chain to the other chain. And because it was so complex, it was complicated not only, but could also result in the loss of funds if not done right. And both these ecosystems actually had strong user base and trying to explain to someone new to crypto was immediately evident to me that if someone is on Uniswap, in order to participate in something on the pancake swap, they needed to go through a bridge. 
Now to go through that bridge, you first needed to have MetaMask, a third party wallet stored up, back that up, which is a whole nother story on its own, approve the tax, click the swap button, and then manually input the RPC for the BSC contract at the time, and then switch wallet servers to retrieve your tokens on the other side, and then do what you wanna do on the Binance Smart Chain chain, only to have to come back to Ethereum doing this in reverse when you want to when you want to get back to the ETH chain. And honestly, just saying that is already a mouthful. And the innovator inside me couldn't help but to think of a better way to go about this. I mean, you got to think that something like this is not accessible and there's got to be a better way that we can interact with all these ecosystems. So this sparked sort of a light bulb moment to think like, okay, if there's an alternate chain popping up now, there's got to be more chains that are going to come up because there's a lot of improvement that can be done, but it doesn't re make these obsolete or redundant. And such, I thought to myself that for blockchain really to gain new users, it now needed a solution that was interoperable with all these blockchains. So whether it be Curate's very own exchain, Solana, Matic, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, Algorand, Avalanche, whatever it may be, they, these chains had to be interoperable and anything we build upon this had to be blockchain agnostic without any of these complexities because despite some of these communities being small i mean you could see they were growing really rapidly and they were getting really strong user bases with some really great revolutionary innovative stuff as such as blockchain and in the space we kind of saw something somewhat of a wall garden kind of forming and this became a major motivator for myself and i began plotting a backend flow that would allow all the complexities to sit with somebody like myself and my team or people that have been in the cryptocurrency space and have seen its evolution to really take that and simplify it for the newcomers because being here for so long i knew how overwhelming it was but it was just as simple as in 2017 and i wanted to take this onto myself and simplify it for the users and allow a harmonious non-restrictive ecosystem with the benefits of this ecosystem of all the chains brought nicely together into one simple website or app. Thus, the Curate's blockchain agnostic MVP of Curate was born. And we pushed on to create the Apple experience that everybody knows and loves today. And I'm sure on your end, you're probably sitting on an Apple device now, some of you, and just know how simple and easy it makes in everyday life. And that's when we started to imagine a solution with all the advantages of blockchain technology, but with no understanding needed to build upon it. But you could benefit from the entire ecosystem. And with this mindset and res the resources we now had available due to the strong positioning we had established using my little venture into DeFi, I set out to solve all the little things that annoyed me and I felt could have been done better in crypto space and then after looking at DeFi, this is when nft started to pop up obviously i'd heard about it in 2017 with crypto kitties which i'm sure everyone that's how you heard of nfts too i was like hey why don't i go and try my and make my first nft on variable so i went over there and i think i even used uh, for those that know who participated in yield farming the dgen lizard on coin geckos page where they would state all the different yield farming things because i thought it was cool and I went over to Rarible and tried to mint my first NFT. And boy, oh boy, was it flooded with fees, approvals, complexities, and steps that could have just really have been made simple. I mean, people in crypto are really smart and super innovative. Don't get me wrong, but they really like to take the wiggly route from A to Z. And no hard feelings because they need to be that foundational technology. And I just thought there has to be a simpler way to go about this. And I mean, after all, all we're doing is uploading a picture and listing it on a marketplace. How different is that to Instagram besides the fact that it has the authenticity? And then I started to imagine sort of a one tap minting feature, as simple as adding a picture to Instagram, but with the transparency, validity and authenticity of blockchain. This is what I designed. And today I take pride in knowing that when my grand or my granddad asks me about NFTs and wants to make one, I'm pretty sure he's not going to have a problem using this feature and I can finally explain it to him in a simple way. And then he can go ahead and store some old family picture 
with a bad picture of myself as every grandparent does on the blockchain. And I'd probably buy that for the memories. Or my little cousin, who when she decided to, to embrace our artistic side, didn't go and buy a pen and paper. She bought herself an iPad and an Apple Pencil. I mean, it's only the natural next step that we got to have a platform for her to sell her beautiful work on or for these millions of artists. And that's when the opportunity now became clear. And I started to realize that this new generation that I like to call modern day street artists now would have a platform to sell their work and build a reputation. A modern problem required a modern solutions. And individuals growing up in a tech oriented world no social interaction and enjoyment through their devices. I mean, I know a lot of parents who shout their kids for playing on their de devices, but how can they do that when in our generation going outside was the equivalent of that? I mean, that's just how it's evolved. And when COVID hit and accelerated our reliance on technology, we found new means for enjoyment and other ways to express ourselves. I mean, ultimately human beings are social by nature. And thinking 10 years from now, when these kids become adults, they're going to think us hanging pictures in our house over here. I mean, why would we hang pictures in our house when my friend a thousand miles away cannot see? How's that going to work? I could just keep this space sort of free in my house and go over to my virtual home in the metaverse and have all my friends view my digital showrooms. There's no doubt one day we're going to see crypto punks and that being hung out there in the same way Van Gogh's are viewed these crypto punks are going to be viewed as the Van Gogh that started the pivotal point of this technology revolution in the digital art world. And what this space truly needs to build a gap, and just to close up on the other point, it's just the natural evolution that we're going to see this transition into a more fully functional digital world. And it's bound to happen, if not accelerated, by the trajectory of COVID. And what this space really needs to bridge this gap is to tackle the major issues of simplicity and accessibility. And right now, the, dev, the blockchain and cryptocurrency space is very much what I like to call a layered dev space, meaning it's really complex. And it's not tailored really to the regular consumer. I mean, imagine you go to your favorite car dealer, BMW or whatever it may be, and your car manufacturer doesn't sell you the car, but rather they sell you the instructions on how to build a car for you to drive the car. And that's where blockchain truly is right now. And being in its early stages, this is completely normal for cryptocurrency. And through time, it will evolve. To me, something is truly only important if it adds value to my life. And makes it easier. And without a doubt, blockchain adds value. It's just about delivering that value to consumers in a way that makes sense and is simple and understandable or something that they're familiar with. Allowing users to participate in DeFi protocols and access this higher value of returns without any of these complexities or in a simple to use interface that we're familiar with that popular banks or services that we use today. Creating an app that allows us to seamlessly use our credit card, Apple Pay, PayPal, or whatever it may be, to load up an account and participate in crypto and replacing the outdated account numbers with usernames or dom domain, similar to what Revolut and Unstoppable domains do. What I see is, over time, the blockchain space continuing to build layer on layer until it's ready for a layer to be built that can be presented to our consumers. Solving this issue of being blockchain agnostic and, seam and having a seamless fiat on-ramp off-ramp solution is a good start. I mean, let's face it, fiat is not redundant yet. We still need money in our accounts to carry on with life and to actually survive. And here at Create, we're really working on bringing these blockchains into one harmonious solution. And once this is solved, this would allow others to save time and focus on actually adding value to consumers once the foundation is strongly set. And using our curious minds and time in crypto, time in crypto to simplify the complexities in the space so that everybody doesn't need to be a blockchain developer, but can solely build on top of this technology to add value to the consumer's lives. Decentralization is the next step, particularly in today's society where mistrust among centralized 
bodies is common and big companies misusing our in information. And what's funny is we let them do it because we're so reliant on them. And honestly, we just don't have a better alternative. But knowing about blockchain and being as enthusiastic as I am for it, why should we be we're, when there could be a safer, more fair alternative? No one individual or company deserves that much power. And blockchain decentralization makes that possible. To add to this, did you know that 1.7 billion people worldwide do not actually have access to banking? I mean, that's crazy in a society that's not only flooded. It's actually becoming in, in a society that's not only flooded with technology, but also encouraged upon, particularly now with COVID, where physical money is becoming obsolete or is actually becoming discouraged because of, well, you don't want to test the money because you might get sick. And ultimately, what we need to do is take all these amazing offerings of DeFi that it provides, of borrowing and lending, financial services, you name it, uh, synthetic tokens, the art market, borderless payments, transparent, no centralized body. I mean, the list goes on forever, 24 seven accessibility, and really take this and bundle it into something that the, uh, the user can use and that is simple for the users. Then we can look at NFTs and how it's empowering digital artists and transforming the way collectibles are collected and social cloud is obtained. That's just only scratching the surface as these applications will expand. As popular as you see, so with the Def DeFi craze that started off crazy, as I mentioned before, with yields and rug pulls and how it evolved into protocols like Aave, make a DAO and curates own wallet, as you see today, that are really providing beneficial and useful financial service products that are actually outbeating and outpacing inflation, unlike your traditional financial products. It's actually 100% collateralized too, so safer than your banks. I mean, bank runs are possible, as we've seen in Greece, happened not even too long ago. That these will provide a financial service that are more efficient than traditional institutions, trustless and easily accessible. And I'd like to compare NFTs to DeFi in its early stages and could even be seen evolving to medical applications, which I'm not going to touch on today. Digitizing ticket events to prevent freeloaders coming into events is something NFT could solve. Bond issuing tokens in the form of NFTs could be solved. Now, how you may ask on that is very few know that NFTs can be embedded with a value. Coupling that with smart contracts, you could have an NFT with a set USTT value that releases in a couple of years, fully verifiable. So we know we can trust our government. NFTs is like the art market and go on to merge with DeFi and allow users to get loans in return for popular NFTs with value. What makes a Van Gogh painting really valuable is truly just its following and that people say it's valuable. That's what's made it a one of one. Van Gogh in his times was not a hit. Nobody really looked to Van Gogh and said, oh, I want your painting. But really when the art market got noticed when Van Gogh got value. And that's how I see the NFT market as this generation grows up and becomes more self-aware. And that's just scratching the surface. And we're going to see NFTs starting to be served as collateral, similar to the art market. And really, this is just so much more inclusive and accessible method for consumers to obtain loans. Not only don't you have to carry around and secure a chunky piece of artwork, but it's also verifiable and traceable to the creator, freely accessible, and can be done from the comfort of your own home. No centralized institution telling you who or what you can do. And now, guys, I'd like to just wrap it up. I think I might be a little bit over time, but I hope what I've said today is truly informative. And I'd like to leave you with something to imagine. Imagine an app that combine, combines all the DeFi aspects of blockchain, the simplicity that we know and love of Apple today with the capabilities of NFTs and an easy on-ramp off -ramp service that gives you that comfort of going back to your bank account, as well as being blockchain agnostic, meaning not having to worry about these seven or 70 different ecosystems. These worlds are not meant to operate individually, but rather harmoniously and together. Can you imagine the value of something like this and what it would bring to a consumer, how it would accelerate the mass adoption of blockchain? Imagine your entire 
gallery, your NFT, your art gallery in the palm of your hand, a fully fledged bank account in your pocket, decentralized, trustless, and 24 seven with financial services for its users that knows no borders and doesn't discriminate with the highest and most fair yields in the market that we know exists today and allowing users to spend their funds on freely and without restriction. A completely inclusive ecosystem with none of the complexities. And I'm, I'm proud to tell you that this is what we're building here at Curate, that ultimate bridge between the traditional world and this blockchain technology, but giving you that comfort of the traditional world. The future of blockchain lies in making it accessible and breaking down these barriers and allowing for the masses to reap all the benefits. We are the future and the future is blockchain and a once physical issue now requires a digital solution. Thank you for your time.